Hello and welcome back to another edition of the Jacob and Jacob podcast. I'm your host, Jacob Robump, joined as always by my co-host, Jacob Hare. And today we are very lucky to be joined by former NFL head coach, Dirk Cutter. Coach, thank you so much for being with us today. Yeah, good morning, fellas. How are we doing? We're doing great. We're doing great. So, uh, Coach, you recently announced uh, your retirement from coaching. So I just want to start by saying congratulations on that. And we wanted to ask if you've picked up any new hobbies and how are you adjusting to uh, retirement? Yeah, well, actually, uh, it's funny because uh, normally for an NFL coach, uh, tomorrow would be the last day of OTAs and Friday you would start vacation. And uh, since I'm on permanent vacation now, uh, I would always try to cram as many rounds of golf as I could into the those four weeks we were off and I've probably already played about 25 rounds of golf this summer. So I'm trying to get better at golf and uh, slowly chipping away at it. And hopefully that's my, that's my new, my new hobby. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough game. Uh, I'm not, I'm not too good myself. <laughs> well, coach, I mean, if the opportunity ever presented itself to get back into coaching, would you ever go back or you've done forever? Yeah, I think I'm done forever. I mean, I was, I was coaching football for 39 years. That's over half my life. Uh, and I coached on every level, high school level, uh, non-scholarship division two, uh, small college, major college, NFL. Uh, I loved, I loved it, but I mean, 39 years is a long time to, to do any profession. And, you know, I'm, I'm just time for me to do some other stuff. And, uh, you know, uh, I've got my youngest son has a couple of years left to play at Boise State. I'm anxious to follow follow Boise State's team and travel with them and see their away games and uh, be able to watch football as a fan a little bit more. But I think I think the coaching part has probably done me. So, a Coach, in the NFL, you were an offensive coordinator and a head coach at different points. Talk about the differences between each position and sort of how you how you fill those roles. Sure. Well, as a, as an offensive coordinator, I was uh, let's see, was I? I think I was always working for a defensive head coach. So you know, when that's the case, you know, you know, you you're responsible for half of the team, and uh, you know, you're not you're not necessarily responsible for all the day to day operations of putting a practice schedule together and handling discipline issues if they come up. Uh, when you're the head coach, you have to have answers for everything. I mean, you deal with every player on the team. Uh, you do have to have answers for discipline. You have to have, you know, meetings with the athletic director if you're in college and boosters if you're in college. You have to have meetings with the GM if you're in the NFL. So, you know, being a head coach, it just – all encompassing where, uh, you know, offensive coordinator wise, you're basically just, uh, you know, you just have to make sure the offense is running smoothly. Now, some of, what are some of the best qualities that a head coach can have in the NFL? I think uh, the number one is he's got to be a great communicator because he, he's got to relate to so many different people. I mean, number one, you have to be able to relate to the players. I mean, you have to have an open line of communication with the players and, you know, obviously, uh, there's been a trend here the last few years that the NFL has been hiring <clears throat> much younger guys as as head coaches. Maybe, maybe that's the reason is maybe the owners feel like those younger guys can relate to the players more. But, uh, you know, communication, uh, you have to have uh, the vision for the football team and uh, you, you have to set the tone every day as far as uh, work ethic uh, how how you handle guys that don't fall in line? The NFL has a NFL has a set of rules for that, a, a fine system. Uh, you, you know, you have to you have to be uh, the face of the franchise is always going to be a, a player, but you know you're the one that's going to be standing up there in front of the microphones almost every day. I think it's five times a week in the NFL talking about your team and. Uh, in this day and age where just look at your podcast. I mean, there's so much coverage media wise uh, of, of NFL teams, NFL players that, you know, every word you say is under the microscope. So, you, you know, that's, that's a slippery slope in and of itself. Now, did you like, I want to move on. Oh, no, no, you're good. 
Did you like the media commitments? <laughs> Did you like the media commitments that at were required first, to do? Yeah, first, yeah, at first, no. You know, when I was a, when I first became a head coach in college, uh, no, I did not. I always felt like that was time taken away from what I could be doing football wise. That was the wrong way to look at it. That was, that's one of the things when you go from being an assistant coach to a head coach, you're not really prepared for. There's no, there's no book that tells you that. And the amount of time that you spend with the media can get overwhelming. You know, one thing people don't realize, you know, just talking about being a head coach and dealing with the media you know, you care so much about winning and losing. Okay. So say whether it's college on a Saturday night or NFL on a Sunday afternoon, let's just say you lose the game. It's bad enough to lose the game, right? That's bad enough. That hurts because you put so much into it during the week. Well, then you have to, you have to go up and do the post game press conference and, you know, your emotions can still be raw and, you know, you're getting questioned on why this happened, why, what went wrong here. You know, they always want to blame somebody. All right, so you got to go through it then. Monday, the day after the game, or Sunday in college, you have another press conference where, guess what? You get to, you've already watched the film. You've already seen all the mistakes that were made, maybe mistakes that you made as a coach even. And guess what? You got to get, you got to go through the whole loss again. Then a lot of times a coach will have a radio show on, say, Tuesday or Wednesday. Guess what? You go through the game, you go through losing it again. And, you know, what people don't realize is you, you sometimes have to relive that loss four or five times when, you know, the coach part of you wants, they always call it the 24 hour rule, win or lose 24 hours to enjoy the win or feel sorry for yourself about the loss. And then you got to move on to the next opponent. But uh, it's, it's difficult when you're a- answering questions all week about stuff that happened in the past. So I want to move on to talk about uh, one of the players that you coached when you were the head coach of the uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and that's quarterback Jameis Winston. Um, talk about Jameis and what he is as a player and as a leader and uh, what maybe we can expect with him in uh, New Orleans this season. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, Jameis, Jameis from, a, from a young age growing up uh, in Alabama and then uh, as a high school player in Alabama, his college career at Florida State, He's always been uh, a terrific competitor. He's always been a winner. He is a really good leader. I mean, and I, I believe that leaders lead by example with their work ethic. And you, you can ask, you can ask any player that's played with Jameis. I mean, he he does set the tone for how guys are supposed to work in the off season, uh, in season. You know, he's the first guy in the building, last guy to leave. He studies, he'll put in the time, he'll, he'll train. Uh, he, he is tough. He is very smart. He cares about football. He loves to win. He loves to compete. Uh, you know, Jameis's only issue really has been that he's turned the ball over at a higher rate than, you know, that, that is going to consistently win in the NFL. And, uh, you know, he, I think, I think a year with Drew Brees and Sean Payton last year in New Orleans, people tend to forget that as a, as a number one pick in the draft, Jameis came in and started from day one in Tampa. And uh, he never did sit behind another quarterback and, and watch and observe how that guy did. I mean, some of the best quarterbacks we've ever seen in this league, Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, they weren't, they weren't starters. Brett Favre was not a starter to, to begin his career. So maybe that year sitting behind Drew Brees, I will, we'll have to wait and see. That'll be, a, that'll be interesting to see what the Saints do between Jameis and Taysom Hill. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, a Jace, uh, I'm a Jameis fan. The one thing he's got to do is get the, get the turnovers under control. Mm-hmm. Now, do you believe that Jameis Winston could be a winning quarterback in the NFL again? Absolutely. I mean – Absolutely. I think, I think Jameis uh, definitely has the skills and the talent. Obviously you have to, you have to have good, good team around you. You have to be in the right scheme. Your team has to stay healthy. There's a lot of variables, but uh, yes, I do believe Jameis can be a, a winning quarterback in the NFL. For sure. For sure. I think uh, Jameis is definitely deserving uh, of the starting job in New Orleans this year. I think 
Taysom Hill, I'm not sure sure about him as a quarterback, but I think Jameis definitely deserves another shot. But um, well, we, I, I want to move on and talk about the NFL oh, draft oh, a little. I'm oh, sorry. What were you saying? Okay. No, go ahead. I want to move on and talk about the NFL draft a little bit and being inside a war room with the GM, helping make the picks. What is that experience like, and what is sort of that first night like, and then sort of into the weekend? Yeah, um, you know, every team and every GM has their own way of, of running the running the draft. Uh, you know, when I was in Jacksonville, I got to see Shaq Harris and then later Gene Smith as as GMs run the draft. When I was in Atlanta, it was Thomas Dimitrov. When I was in Tampa, it was Jason Light. And they all they all have their their own ways of doing it. Um, you know, the draft so much work goes goes into the draft behind this behind the scenes mostly by the the gm his staff the scouting staff oh my gosh the the miles that they log the time they grading players watching players doing their background is crazy and it all boils down to those those three days and you're in the draft room It, it is exciting and you know you as a coach you you don't maybe watch all the players, you know, when you're an assistant coach, you, you probably only watch 25 or 30 guys at your position as a head coach. You know, I would watch probably about 120 guys a year, but there there's guys that watch far more than that. And, and scouts and, you know, you become attached to players. There's guys that you're, you're really hoping are there when, when your pick comes, a lot of the work is done on the front end. So, you know, most GMs, I think, would come out and say, once the draft starts, you're just you're just following your board. Uh, the trade thing is very exciting when you're on the clock and you've got to see that how how guys work the phones and they're fielding calls from other other teams about the trade and they're looking at the point chart and all that stuff. But it, it's an exciting time. There's a there's a lot there's a lot of there's a lot of action and the, the draft. It's been proven many times, though. It's it's definitely not an exact science. Yeah. Now, what's the biggest thing you look for when you, you were drafting a player? Well, I'm I'm just a big believer in the film doesn't lie. So, um, you know, regardless of height, weight, speed, and everything else, just me personally, uh, I believe you, you just you look at the tape. I mean, you you look at the tape and. Uh, the guy's either a good football player or he's not based on, on the position he plays and what you're going to ask him to do. So um, <laughs> I think there is there is a ton of uh, overkill that comes in and people, I mean, it's just, if you follow the draft at all on, on TV, the amount of hype certain guys get, both positive and negative, is really mind-blowing and, and uh there's plenty of talking heads out there who talk ad nauseum trying to project how these guys are going to do in the NFL when it really doesn't need to be that complicated. Watch the film. So uh, last season you were the offensive coordinator in Atlanta and obviously uh, the COVID season, but talk about uh, that offense and also after what it was like to coach in uh, such a, such a uh, troubling year. Yeah. uh, COVID the COVID, first of all, it was, it was great that we got to play all the games. I mean, you know, there was a, there was a big concern that we wouldn't even have a season. So the fact that we got the entire season in uh, says a lot. And, and the NFL did a really good job of setting up the, the, the protocol for the players and the coaches, you know, everybody involved. It was tiring, though. I mean, that uh, having, to, having to get tested every single day, even, you know, during your bye week uh, even if for the players on their day off, you still had to get tested every day. Uh, the wearing masks everywhere, the, the zoom meetings over and over and over uh, a lot less practice time on the field with the players. I mean, even, even small things like uh, the way we travel uh, being confined to the hotel on the road. A lot of guys look forward, you know, the night before a game, on the road, just to going out to dinner to their favorite restaurant in a different city. You couldn't do any of that. Uh, but, you know, we did get the games in and, uh, you know, it, it seems from, from where I sit looking from the outside that it's going to be a lot better this year and not having fans. I mean, you know, we played the chargers in, in the new stadium in LA 
and that is such a gorgeous stadium. But to not have any fans there, that was just weird. Uh, you know, even in our home stadium in Atlanta, you know, we had a couple games with no fans, and then I think they were letting like 2,500 or 5,000 fans in. Uh, the, you know, the players feed off that. It's fun. It's fun to have the crowd there. So it was definitely challenging. Uh, COVID, COVID made it challenging, but at the same time, I think it was, it was great for our, for our country and great for everybody that we could, that could at least get the games in because the NFL is so popular. Now, last season with the Falcons, head coach Dan Quinn was fired mid-season, and Falcons defensive coordinator Raheem Morris took over as interim head coach. What was it like for you as the offensive coordinator have that coaching switch mid-season? Yeah, well, as as uh, as someone who who has been both a head coach and an assistant coach, uh, you know, your my heart first of all went out to Dan Quinn because he, you know, he poured his heart and soul into the Falcons, and you know, no one no one likes to be told they're they're no longer needed. I mean, I've been there. That's not a that's not a fun thing to have happen. And Dan Dan Quinn is a a very, very positive, uh, very energetic uh, coach, not only as a head coach, but I'm, I'm really excited to see, see him back with the Cowboys as defensive coordinator this year. Uh, Raheem and, and Dan Quinn are, are, are close friends. I mean, so for Raheem taking over for, for Dan, that was a, a little bit of an awkward situation for him. But, you know, I mentioned earlier that one of the things – a head coach needs to do is be a really good communicator. Raheem handled the situation very well. He, he did a really nice job of communicating with the team exactly what he expected and uh, what, what he wanted on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. He did the same thing with the coaching staff. Uh, um, you know, as an offensive coordinator, you know, my job didn't change that much. I mean, it was the same. It wasn't like we changed a bunch of players. We just changed who the head coach was. Um, and I think, I think both those guys, I think the world of both, both DQ and of Raheem and uh, I wish them both success in their, in their new endeavors. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely cheering for the Falcons as well. I got a lot of, a lot of players I'll be rooting for there as well. What was it like to get to work with uh, so many talented players on that offense, like Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley, quarterback, Matt Ryan, running back, Todd Gurley. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, well, it was it was awesome. I mean, all all the players that uh, you've been I've been fortunate to work with over the years. I mean, you go back to Jacksonville, Fred Taylor and Maurice Jones Drew, quarterback David Garrard. Uh, you know, you, in Atlanta, you you already mentioned that group. Tampa, uh, you know, Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, uh, just uh, Tony Gonzalez, Roddy White. My first time in Atlanta. So work, working with the players is probably the most rewarding thing uh, about, about coaching. And, you know, you see these guys that are elite talent, elite athletes, elite competitors, but yet uh, their willingness, they want to get better. They want to be coached. Uh, they want to, they're willing to work hard. Uh, it's, it's fun to watch those guys uh, grow and come together and bond. It's, it's heartbreaking when those guys get injured. I mean, it's hard, it's hard to watch a guy like Julio Jones, who is, who is such a great competitor and uh, such a tremendous athlete. And, you know, he just, he just couldn't get healthy. And it was really, he just, he probably tried to come back too soon from a hamstring issue that he had early in the year last year. And, you know, he's, he really wants to be out there helping his team. He's a team guy. That, that's hard to watch. Uh, you know, it's frustrating when you don't win as much as, as you expect to win. And, you know, that's one thing I don't think the fans, uh, you know, the fans get disappointed and they get mad when their team doesn't win. I mean, no one's more disappointed than, than the players and the coaches. I mean, we have the highest of expectations for ourselves. So, uh, but, but working with those guys, working with the players at, at all levels, uh, that's, that's what coaching is all about. And that's, that's, why, that's why I was in it. I mean, from the fan perspective, to see a player like Julio Jones get hurt and other great athletes get hurt this past season, it just sucks. It's the worst part of sports. But I want to talk a little bit about Julio Jones. Obviously, a few days ago or weeks, actually, he traded to the Titans. Did you ever sense a feeling of frustration from Julio and that he wanted out of Atlanta? Or was that something that just 
was brought up this offseason by Julio. Yeah, I'm not. I didn't sense that. I mean, you know, there there might have been some stuff uh, below the surface that that I didn't know about. But, you know, that's that's not the Julio that I knew the, the Julio that that I knew. He came to work every day, uh, you know, when when he when he was uh, preparing for a game, uh, he was he was uh, active, uh, participated in meetings. You know, he would he was a good practice player when he even when he was injured, Julio would be out there on the field helping the young receivers, talking to Calvin, talking to Russell Gage, uh, showing them how how he runs his routes and, you know, spots on the field based on the concept where they were supposed to be. So, uh, you know, a, a frustrating year for sure. Uh, you know, I think there's probably Julio is probably fueled some by the doubters that are doubting, uh, you know, what he's going to bring to the Titans right now. And, uh, you know, if, if Julio is healthy, there's no doubt in my mind that, that he will return to uh, elite status as one of the two or three best receivers in the NFL. I certainly agree with you on that. Well, uh, coach, before we let you go, we have a uh, one final question today. And that is, as a coach, what is your favorite trick play that you've ever drawn up in a game? <laughs> you know what? Uh, I'm not a huge trick play guy uh, just because uh, I think, <laughs> I think they have a tendency to go wrong more than they go right. Uh, but going all the way back to my Boise state days. So we're going back to about, uh, I don't know, 1999 or 2000 Boise state versus New Mexico. And we're playing at Bronco stadium. And that's when New Mexico had Brian Erlacher, not only, uh, playing on defense, but they'd also put him in at wide receiver and throw alley oops to him. And I think he caught two touchdowns in our game. But uh, we had a we had a fake punt that we called the Fiddler fake because it was put in after one of our assistant coaches, Dan Fiddler, where we, you know, we had a bunch of misdirection and put the ball put the ball on the ground and everybody ran one way and then the the personal protector picked it up and ran the other way and. Uh, it was late in the game. It was a tight game against New Mexico, and we ran the Fiddler fake for a touchdown, and uh, that was probably the game winner in that game. And at that time, that's before Boise State was a national name. So for, for Boise State out of the Big West Conference to beat New Mexico out of what was then the WAC Conference, uh, that, was a, that was a big win. That was a big win. That was when Boise State was just starting to get rolling. And so to beat, to beat a school like New Mexico was big. That was uh, the pre-Statue of Liberty days for Boise State. Yeah, <laughs> that was a pre, you know, Coach Pete came in with, uh, with the Statue of Liberty, and that was, a, that was a pretty cool pretty cool trick play as well. Yeah, one of the best in college history, for sure. Well, Coach, yeah, for sure. we want to thank you so much for coming on and speaking with, with today. We enjoyed our conversation with you, and we'll have to do it again. Thank you. All right, guys, appreciate you having me. Take care. Have a good thank summer. Thank you.